Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, PO Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036369, 0703 768119. Email address lsmedia at or visit our website at www.livingseed.org. Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. Profaned it. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. Uh, let's stop there. Now, <clears throat> I found this, it will rather look strange. <clears throat> But I discovered that right from the time immemorial, it has always been God's desire to maintain fellowship, relationship with his man. Now, I'm emphasizing this because I want you to know that we are not approaching a reluctant God. It's not as if God is making it impossible for us to see him. I know if you are about to go and see uh, even uh, the local council chairman or you want to go and see the, the, the prime minister, you can see the amount of protocols. You have to first of all book an appointment and sometime you go through all of that for several weeks before they can say, okay, now the Prime Minister is going to see you. And you can imagine the officiality that you are going through. You go through several checks, security checks. They will bring all the uh, detonating uh, uh, gadgets to be sure that you are not going with any bomb. They check all of that. And then at the end of the day, they usher you in. What you may think is private, they are actually still monitoring you while you are there with the Prime Minister. Men make it difficult for people to have access unto him. But our God is actually longing that you should come. And God is offering us, and I want to use two words today as I go ahead. God is offering us not assets, but access. You know, the two words sound alike, but they are far, far different. What God offers us is not assets, it's not properties, it's not materials. Rather, God offers us access, access to him, access to his wisdom, access to his riches and glory, access to his oracles, access to his very presence. When God wants to use a man, he doesn't give him assets. Except nowadays that I see preachers that claim to be millionaires. The preachers that I have known over the years, both in scripture and our contemporary times, the riches of their lives is not the money, it's the access they had into God. The access that God gives you into his power. The access he gives you into his wisdom. The access he gives you into his own personality is the riches of our lives and ministry. And the biggest thing God has been desiring is that we will maximize that access. We will come into his presence fearlessly. 
So I discover that in the Old Testament, God was offering His presence to the children of Israel. God said to Moses, said, bring all of them to the mount, and I will come down. If they can catch a glimpse of my glory once, it will do something in their lives permanently. You see, he said, God will put his fear in your faces so that you may not sin. It is the presence of God actually in people's lives that is the greatest deliverance from sin. Do you know that? Do you know that sin does not thrive where the presence of God is? Do you know that the problem of sin is actually the lack of divine presence? Many times we will even preach to people to run away from sin. But we are actually not getting them to the place where sin can no longer thrive in their lives. The presence of God. If we will bring men into God's presence, whether we speak so much of sin or not, sin will leave them. Do you know that? It is the lack of divine presence in people's lives that makes the power of sin to be so strong. And sin actually only comes to break away the presence of God from a man. So God was coming down in this chapter to reveal himself. But I want you to see what they did. The Bible says, all the people witnessed the thunderings. They witnessed the lightning flashes. They heard the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, what did they do? They trembled and did what? And stood afar off. That was the beginning of the trouble with the children of Israel. That God came to fellowship with them. And what did they do? They stood afar off. And then they appointed. That's the beginning of preaching ministry. That's the beginning of of people needing someone in between them and their God. That was not the plan of God from the beginning. The plan and the purpose of God is that all his people will touch and experience and have access to his presence equally. That was God's plan. <coughs> and even now, that is still God's plan. Yes. Amen. God's plan is that you, me, and that brother will have access unto the presence of God. So they stood up for us and said, No, let God not speak with us. But let Moses. Did you see what they said? They said, Let Moses speak with us, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. There was something that was pushing them away. And so why they stood afar off? And that was what separated Moses from them. The Bible said, And Moses said to the people, Don't fear. God has come to test you. That his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. He didn't come to kill you. So the people stood afar off. But Moses, what did Moses do? He drew near the thick darkness where God was. I'm praying that we will draw near. You can't become great in the hand of God if you stand afar off. There is no anointing afar off. You see, those who draw near and come into, you know, it appears like darkness. It was like a thick darkness. But that is the miracle of it. That where to encounter God is in the secret place. 
<laughs> that your father that seeth in the secret, he will reward you in the open. When Moses drew near into that darkness where God was, he set the agenda for spirituality. The Bible said, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, and the Lord began to give him instruction. You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver, or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. Now, but I saw a provision in verse 24, which we are going to study. But maybe before we study it, we will explore a bit in the Bible <coughs> that all the men that became something in the hand of God, all of them learned to build altars. All of them. Those who have omitted personal altars in their lives, they also became nothing that we can speak about in scriptures. But the instruction now comes from verse 24 on how to build altars unto God. I prefer that we will study it when I'm about to conclude <clears throat> so that I can explore with you that altars, I'm talking of personal altars, it's something that all the men that became tangible instruments in God's hand, they learned to build. It is not just an Old Testament issue, but I'm not talking about, you know, any physical construction. I'm talking of a spiritual experience that these men learned to have personally. Now, let's begin by exploring what I'm talking about. Now, let's, I want us to check people like Noah, people like Abraham, people like Isaac, people like Jacob, what they did when they encountered God and how they sustained their relationship, their intimacy with God. Because you see, at the end of the day, we will be asking, how can I build it? Isn't it? How can I build this unbroken communion with God? And I want us to learn from those who had experienced that. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, in the book of Genesis, if you look at the story of Noah, and I think we should check Noah from Genesis chapter 8. Genesis 8. Look at verse 20. This was after the flood. This was after God had delivered Noah and his family. Look at verse 20. Then Noah did what? Built an altar to the Lord. And he took of every clean animal and of every clean bed and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again cause the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night, shall not cease. Now, I, I want to ask you, it might look a very little issue, but I want you to note it in verse, in verse 20 and 21. When Noah built an altar to the Lord, what was he doing? He was establishing communion. He was attracting God. He was saying, Dear Father, I want to begin again to relate with you. 
see what the result of Noah's personal altar was going to bring to the whole world. The Bible says, and he offered burnt offerings on the altar, and the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then, I don't know whether your version has all of those little, little uh, prepositions that I'm wanting to analyze there. Uh, how did the NIV put it? Verse 21. Mm -hmm. it says, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma uh -huh. and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground. Okay. Is there any other version that puts it differently? Soothing aroma. Eh? Soothing aroma. Soothing aroma, yes. Okay. The odor. Now, what I, I felt is, does God have a sense of smell? Yes. He does. And that something that is sweet, something that is soothing, can move God. It touches God's affection. So I read, he said, then the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, as if God was waiting for something to come out of the altar of Noah. And then was that thing, you know, rolled to, to God's nose. We saw God responding. He said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his use. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. Do you know why that came? It was a result of one man's personal altar. I want to say very quickly that your personal private altar may be the place that will attract God to make a declaration that will bless your generation. You might be thinking that, oh, what good can come out of my personal communion? But I want to say to you that much of what we read in the Word of God, they were God's revelation to individuals that cared to attract His persons. Much of what has blessed our generation and has blessed the whole world, they were the private response of God to someone individual altar. I don't know whether you understand. Yeah, yeah. Do you know that what you need down in your private room in communion with God and God reveals to you whereas in your private room it may be solving your personal immediate need yet that revelation if it is properly kept it could be a source of blessing a source of instruction to our entire generation. Mm -hmm. And all the time that God always wants to speak, I want you to note this. Never at a time did you see God standing on a hill and he's speaking to the air. Mm -mm. He never does. What will become a message for the whole world? God is looking for one man that he can speak it do you understand what I'm saying? So it means then that when we build our personal altar, when we have a personal place of regular meeting with God, where God smells our burnt offering and is moved to releasing His divine wisdom, we are becoming a blessing to the world. What has become the great doctrines of our time came as God's personal revelation to some people, some persons in their private lives when they were seeking God's face. I don't know that you understand. Now, our, the, the church in our time is impoverished because 
more and more and more we are beginning to lack men that digs deeply into God as to bring out treasures from his heart. Mm -hmm. You find that if you, if you remember the songs, the hymns of old, have you ever sat back and looked at those great hymns? Mm -hmm. And the question is, how did they contemplate this? Yes. Mm -hmm. How did they get it? And yet, you will see that it came to them in the privacies of their lives. Mm -hmm. Why they were relating with God in their own personal altars. When they came God's covenant with mankind, that we now refer to as Noah's covenant. It came, not arbitrarily, it came because God smelled a soothing aroma. Not from the bush, but from the altar that Noah built. Somehow in my heart I felt that I could also be used to bless my generation. I could also have been used to bring down something that is in the heart of God for this generation. If I will only build an altar to him. Can you imagine that? We talk so much about Paul. Eh? And all the revelation that we now have about the New Testament church, about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. How did it come to us? How did it come to us? Did you think that God gathered the whole world and he said, look at all of you, listen, this is a great conference and God Almighty began to speak. Is that how it happened? No. No. God just got one man, Paul. And as he was relating with him, Paul spoke about an experience that he was transferred into the third heavens. He was talking of communion. He was not talking about climbing one ladder that took him. He was talking about a communion that took him from the realms of the natural into the very realm of the spirit mm -hmm. where God began to speak to him. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yes, yes. Will you think that Paul was, was so special that what God did for Paul he cannot do for us? No. No. They built altars and God responded. Do you remember how brother John started the book of Revelation? He said, I was in the spirit in the day of the Lord. Yes. Do you remember? Yes. And he was caught up. Yes. You remember how the Lord spoke to him. He said, come up here. And I will show you what shall be. Yes. One individual. That could be in the spirit. In the day of the Lord. Yes. And God can speak to him. Yes. How did Daniel get all that he got? Some of us say, well, they are special people. Yes, they are special but I don't think they are more special than any of us. Mm -hmm. They are not. But what made them special is the altar they built to God. Yes. What could make Daniel a man living far away from his own country in Babylon? What could make him to have such a great influence on the whole country? It was nothing else but this private place that he and God communed. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream? Yes. And nobody could interpret it? Yes. And he was going to kill all the astrologers. Yes. And Daniel came forward and said, Oh king, I learned that you had a dream. Mm -hmm. He said, yes. He said, but I've gathered all the astrologers, all the scientists, nobody can tell me about this dream. I'm going to this. He said, okay, can you give me some time? I will go and talk to God about it. Do you remember? And can you imagine Daniel? He gathered his three friends. They discussed, they prayed. <clears throat> then they went to sleep. Then in the middle of the night, the Lord responded and gave him meaning of all the dreams. Eh? The following morning he came. And said, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, the Lord, the revealer of secrets, have given me 
the dream you dreamt yesterday. And he told him all these dreams. And he gave him the interpretation of it. And it came to pass. Now, how did it come about? Is that there was a Daniel that could tell the king and everyone say, relax, I'm going to meet with the revealer of secrets tonight. And he's going to tell me. Did you understand what I'm talking yes. about? Could there be a problem in, the, in this country? No. And then we have men like ourselves mm -hmm. who can say, please, wait. We will bring you answers to what you are confused about. Yes. And we only use our access. Do you understand that? Yes. We just use our access okay. to the Father. And because we have access to him, we are bringing something that the whole nation is going to be affected from. That's how it happened. Mm -hmm. Economic problems. It bothers me that Christians, they look incapacitated. That we cannot come forward and bring divine wisdom to bear upon what is troubling people in our generation. And the whole reason is that either we are lazy in using our access to the throne of grace. You know, I'm talking more than asking for little problems. I'm talking about relating with the God of heaven. You know, attracting him into a communion with our lives that makes him to speak on issues that affect mankind. Noah, because of his own personal offering that he made, God smelled a sweet, soothing aroma. Then God spoke in his heart. He said, never again, never again will I destroy mankind, no matter how evil his imagination was. And since then, until now, God was bound by what he said. Yeah. But where did he say it? Where did he say it? In a public stadium? No. Eh? Where did he say it? In a big gathering? Where did he say it? Into a personal life of Noah. I don't know whether you get my picture. Do you know that your private relationship with God could bring a great blessing to our generation. God could be making a commitment simply because of your personal altar. God could smell something coming out of your own offering and he will be moved in his heart to make a commitment that several generations of men will benefit from. And that's how they bless their generation. And we are still being blessed by their own personal altars. And what I'm saying is that the God who related with them has not changed. Mm -hmm. He is still here. And we have even a bigger and a greater access to him in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. That when Jesus Christ went on the cross, the veil was broken. The way to the only of holies was made open. And he said, come, come unto me and let us reason together. We have an access that could cause eternal things to flood our land, our generation, if only there will be brothers and sisters who are willing to build an altar and access God. Now, why Noah did that? There was another man that was delivered from destruction like Noah was. Do you remember that man? Lot. Mm -hmm. eh? yeah. Lot was delivered from Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. But there was an omission in the life of Lot. What was the omission? He did not build an altar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lot was delivered with his two daughters. And when they got to the place, instead of them to build an altar, to offer
offer a burnt offering to God and similarly to say, God, what next? The only thing that I read in the Bible in the book of Genesis 19 was that Lot got drunk. And his two daughters, they looked at one another and said, look, there are no men anywhere else. Can I ask you, is that true? Yes. There were men. Because Lot's uncle, Abraham, eh, he is still growing and having life and God is blessing him. What should he have done? If I thought they were even looking for a man to marry, is it not for Lot to say, let's settle down. Let me trace whether my uncle is still alive. Let's go back to him. But because he never built an altar, Lot grew with Abraham. Lot watched Abraham build altars. But Lot never built a personal altar. Now that's one thing about building a relationship with God. Do you know why? You can stay with a man of God who has a personal communion with God. You could even enjoy his own communion and yet you have not built your own. Eh? You could be enjoying the result of another man's communion. He comes every day and says, Thus says the Lord, and you are blessed. He's speaking and says, Oh Father, I thank you that you have done this already. And he prays, miracles take place. You could enjoy the result of his own communion, but you've not built your own. Lot was many years with Abraham. Abraham built altars, which we are going to see now, but Lot never built one. When Lot got to, to, to Sodom, he didn't build an altar. His two daughters, the first two daughters, were married to Sodomites. When he went to call them and said, look, God is going to destroy this place, let's go out. What were his son-in-laws doing to him? The Bible said they ridiculed him. Can you imagine a father-in-law? You sent for your son-in-laws, those who married your daughters, and all they could do is to walk out on you and love you to scorn and say, I think you are confused. The first thing is, that how did he train his daughters that they went and married unbelievers? He had no altar. No altar. I was touched that some kings came and raided Sodom some years ago and they took away Lot's properties and his children and his wife and everything. Do you remember? And it was Abraham that went with 318 persons in his own house to go and rescue Lot. Now, whom do you think should make Thanksgiving offering after that deliverance? It was Lord, but Lord did it. Rather, it was Abraham that paid tithe to Melchizedek. Those are the quiet things that made Lot almost a useless non-entity in the word of God. He had no personal order. His uncle fought for him, but he never had a place where you could start with God and say, Lord, for delivering me, I want to thank you and I want to start working with you. There are many things that God could use to start you off in intimate relationship with him. It could be a deliverance. It could be an answered prayer. It could be a healing from a sickness. Eh? It could be something that God particularly did for you or your family. And that could start you off. That could be the beginning of saying, the Lord who did this two years ago is my God. He will do it again. And that could be a beginning of a deep relationship. Yes. Yes. But Lot missed all of that. After that great deliverance from Sodom, he only committed incest with his daughters. No wonder today there's nothing about Lot that we can talk about. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Lot just ended a great opportunity in shambles. 
the Bible said to us about Lot, it said, remember Lot's wife. That's all. That's all about Lot. And the children that came out of Lot, do you remember them? They are the Moabites and the Ammonites. And these are people that God said must never enter into the congregation of the people of God because they were accursed. How could a man who has experienced the grace of God become like that? I can tell you the only reason is that he had no altar, no personal altar. We are all here, brethren. We are enjoying the fellowship. We are enjoying the corporate anointing. And we are enjoying the ministry that God has raised in our midst. And sincerely speaking, if we dig into their lives, you'll find that several of the things that they now share with us, they didn't read it from books. They got it in their private place of communion. We have enjoyed it. But God is asking, where is your own? Where is the altar you are building to me so that I can begin to talk with you? I can begin to move with you. I can begin to relate with you. Where are your own orders? That place where God finds it free to release himself, to release his grace to you and through you become a channel of blessing to our world. Lot did not build an altar. And that's why we couldn't, there's nothing to say about him. Now go back to Abraham. Let's see Abraham. I want you to see what this altar is. And how do we progress with it before we will stop today. Now, in verse, in verse 6, chapter 12. Thank you. I thought I have already announced the chapter. Genesis 12. Uh, you know the story, how God called him out and how he left and how he departed into the land of Canaan. So verse 6. Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the Terebin tree of Moreh, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, verse 7, to your descendants, I'll give this land. So what did Abraham do? What did he do in verse 7? And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now listen to this. There. Where? Where God appeared to him. There he built an altar. Now I want to say that altars are not arbitrary. Relationship with God are not arbitrary. I want to say that where God appeared to you, there is the right place to begin your relationship. I hope that's not complicated. Where you have met God, in that aspect where you sense that God has intervened for you, where God had appeared to you, it may be in a little matter. That was enough a place to begin your communion. You see, I wish to be explicit. I wish to say that you don't have to build your altar on issues where God has not appeared to you. Don't build your prayer life on arbitrary presumptions of other people. There is none of us here sitting here that God has not appeared to you in one way. Otherwise, you wouldn't be born again. Something happened and you gave your life to Christ. Isn't it? If you can remember where and how that happened, that is where to start to build your altar. A man of God may come somewhere and say, yes. Oh, as I was just walking, the Spirit just spoke to me. And I just saw the glory of God. Angels just came down here. And they were just telling me, my son, don't be afraid. Now, that doesn't need to intimidate you. 
You don't need to be struggling that you have to see an angel. You don't have to see an angel. You say, thank God for what you have shown to that brother. Thank God for his experience. But there is something that God has appeared to you about. It's authentic. Start from there. Hallelujah. Are you getting me now? Don't allow the stories of others' experience to make you think that your own experience with God is not authentic. Mm. Where God has appeared to you is good enough a basis of your relationship. If God does something for you, no matter how little, that was sufficient to attract him and say, yes, as you did for me last year, you are starting a relationship. You are building on what he had appeared to you on. A lot of people want to build a relationship with God on something of another people. That is not going to work. And you know that all of us can be enjoying Jesus. Do you know that? All of us can feel his presence in our lives. It doesn't have to be as bogus as another person's story. Whereas, if Paul were to stand here, he would be talking of Damascus' experience. Am I right? Mm. So, in the noonday, I saw a flash of light. I fell down and I was blind for three days. People say, wow. <clears throat> Wonderful. Great. But, if Lydia eh, was going to give her own testimony, she would just say, we were in a prayer meeting by the riverside in Caesarea Philippi. Mm -hmm. And two men walked in, I think three of them. I didn't know their name, but I later found out that it was Paul Silas and Timothy. Mm -hmm. They just joined our prayer meeting. And the man, Paul, began to speak. And as he spoke, my heart suddenly opened and I began to understand what he was saying. And that moment, I felt the love of Jesus and I gave my life to Christ. There was no flash of light. There was no thunder. But I saw him. That is enough to build your altar. And you see, he built an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. Our relationship with God must be built on what he has done to us. Let's be real. Let us be personal. What God has done for you is what he has done for you. And what he has done for you is good because it comes from God. Why don't you build from that? And if you learn to build from that which he has done for you, you can be sure he's going to come and speak bigger things. But you know what happens to many of us? We think that our experience of Jesus is too little to become something. So we ignore it. Then we are onlookers and admirers of other people's experiences. And we keep saying, oh God, I don't think you are with me. And God say, why? Because you have never shown yourself to me as an angel. The time you showed yourself to that man that came from America. No. He doesn't have to do that. He said, in the way I have appeared to you, that's how I want you to know me. Let's start from there. Yes. We can build this intimacy even right from today. Mm-hmm. We can. And your experience of Jesus can be as real as long as it is progressive, it is growing. Nobody can predict the extent to which God can go with you if you will build on with this. Hallelujah. Now the Bible says, And he moved from there. Look at verse 8. He moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There, he did what again? 
He built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Did you see progressive altars that Abraham was building? So Abraham journeyed, going on still towards the south. Then I want you to see two things quickly in the life of Abraham. While he was in the land of promise, where God sent him, we are told that there was a famine. Here was a man in the center of God's will, walking correctly with God. Then there was famine in the land. I wished Abraham simply just waited and went back to his altar and said, Father, you sent me to a land and here there is no food. What do I do? But he made, he took a wrong step. Yes. What did he do? He went down to Egypt. Mm. Maybe because he heard, people saying there is food in Egypt. That's where to go now. He started migrating with those that had no commission of God on their lives. You know sometimes you are in the will of God. And there is a sudden famine. That there is a difficulty where God has sent you. Does not mean God is not with you. Now he went down. One of the things I noted as he went down to Egypt was that he didn't build an altar. His altars were broken when he went to Egypt. But what challenged me as I look at the life of this man was that when God restored him from Egypt in chapter 13, I want you to see what happened. In verse 3, chapter 13, verse 3, he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to where? To the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ahai. And to where? Verse 4 now. To the place of the altar which he had made there at first. Excuse me. Can I say something? That that you slept is not the problem. The biggest problem is that you don't know where to return to. That's the biggest problem. Nobody glories that I have never fallen. That's not the glory of a Christian. The glory of a Christian is that though a righteous man falls seven times, God did not forsake him. You see, what I discovered was that when Abraham missed the step and went to Egypt, and you know many things happened in that Egypt, he told a lie. Eh? He mortgaged his wife. You remember he went somewhere with his wife, and when they were about to enter, they said, look, we're in a strange country. And I know you are beautiful. These people will snatch you and they will kill me. So just tell them that you are my junior sister. That's a great man of God. Beginning to tell lies because he has missed the step. But you see, you will be wondering whether God will have chopped off his head. That's not what God will do. God is always the God of second chance. Yeah. Amen. When God appeared to him again and took him out, he returned to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. Yeah. So what is the use of an altar? An altar is a place that you return to if you miss your step. You see, when you read Revelations, I think chapter 2 and chapter 3, and the Spirit was speaking to some churches, he said, remember from where you are falling and repent and do the first walk. You remember he said something like that? He said, you have left your first love. I can't say you therefore repent and rescue what remains that are about to die. Why is God saying that? There is something God could refer back to. You see, when we build altars, when we build relationship with God, there are times, and I want us to be frank about that, there are times in your walk with the Lord 
that you miss your step. And the only thing God will use to bring you back is what he had been saying to you before. How many of you keep notes of what God says to you in your quiet time? Wonderful. I want you to keep it. You know there are times the devil comes to you and says God has forgotten you. God has left you. And all you needed to do is to take your old notes. Yeah. As you are flipping through. You say in January 13, yeah. 1987, the Lord spoke to me from so and so passage. And this is what he said. How could God, who just spoke to me a few years ago, say he is no more going with me? And then you flip again. You saw what God said to you in 1995. Then you flip again. You saw what God said in year 2000. Abba. Say no. God is too consistent to abruptly say he's no more going with me. You must be a liar. <laughs> but you see, when you don't have records, when you don't have things that you have noted in your work with the Savior, how will you trace your path? Those who make map, the cartographers, I think they call them cartographers. How do they make maps? Do you know what they simply do? As they are passing through a place, they see landmarks, they peg it. They move again, they peg. They move again, they peg. When they want to plot the graph, they are not concerned about intervening spaces. They are looking at their pegs. And as they plot grass around the pegs, they have created a path. And suddenly they have surveyed the whole place. And suddenly you have a map of an area. Many of us, we are living without mapping our own lives. And the only thing that God gives us to map his relationship with us is our own altars as we build it to him. Do you remember when you took me to the Rock of Ages? And you see, what touched me was what Reverend Top Lady did. After that experience, you know, for someone else, he will have that experience and he will go home and just take a cup of tea. And that will be all. Do you know? But when he got home, as he sat back, he was looking at that horrendous experience that he had and how he was delivered. And he looked at the cleft of that rock that kept him and his horse. Then, as if he knelt down to say, thank you, Jesus. And then the revelation of the rock of ages came to him. Now, I didn't know about that story. But I tell you, that song, Rock of ages, clear for me, had affected millions. Not just in this place, but all over the world. That song had been translated to as many languages that have the Bible as you can count. I learned that song in my native tongue before I ever knew anything about English. It's such a powerful word. But he got it as he was building an altar over an experience that he had. Amen. And see how it has become a blessing to the whole world. What do you do with your own experiences? What do you do when God intervened in a situation? Did you just wave your hand? Or you build another and say, Father, so you can do this. And God will have spoken further. That's what this man did. So when he missed the step, he could only return to the place of his first altar. When we build altars, we are raising anchors for our spiritual path. I know there are some of you that you had a great experience with God some time back, some years ago. It was wonderful. Suddenly there was a wave of dryness that took all of those away. 
and you have always felt you can't get back there, you can get back there. Actually, you can just simply go back and repair that altar. Start from where you knew him. Sing the whole songs that affected your heart before. Sing it again. You'll be surprised that God will come again. Call him the name he showed you that time. Don't struggle about what people are saying now. Which doesn't make much meaning to you. Go back to where you first met him. Go back to where you first knew him. Sing the first songs he taught you. Read those passages that moved you to tears before. You will see him come afresh. That's the purpose of building altars. We can build intimacy with God. And the fact that you miss your step once does not mean you must always miss your step. You can come back. This brother returned to his first place of altar. And then I noticed the quarrel between Lot and himself. Do you remember the quarrel? And the matter was so much. And God came and said, look, let Lot go. And when Lot took all the beautiful places the well watered land and went and left Abraham in that dry land. The Bible says, God appeared to him. In chapter 13, verse 14, and he said to him, After Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are. Look northward, southward, eastward. You know, it is not those promises that I want to talk about today. It is what he did. You see, God brings promises to you many times. Am I right? But those promises are past. Because you didn't tie them down. You didn't build an altar on it. You didn't build a, a relationship with God on it. You didn't say, God, you said you will do this for me. I am here. How do we work it out? You just allow it to pass. There are many great prophetic utterances that come in our meetings. Isn't it? But nobody takes it so serious. Eh? You are in a meeting and the Spirit is saying, My son, I have turned my eyes unto you. And I'm going to walk with you. I'm not going to forsake you. You are in that meeting. And while the word is coming, something lived in your spirit and said, Yes, it's for you. Then, after the meeting, what did you do? You went and shook the hand with the prophet and said, Oh, that's what is for me. And you went away. <laughs> is that what to do? No. It was to take that word and get back to your closet and build an altar with it. Yeah. And say, Father, I heard you speak today yeah. that you are going to do this in my life. I am here. Mm-hmm. Where will you start it? How will you begin it? Suddenly you will discover that what the prophet prophesied in the church was just a summary of what God wanted to say. Now that you have come with your altar, you will see God coming down. You will now begin to speak elaborately. Elaborately. And applicably. And it will amaze you that what people prophesy on the pulpit it's just, it's just like God calling your attention and say, I want to talk to you. Come and see me. <laughs> but you see, because we don't know how to build an altar, we allow all those announcements to pass and nobody follows it up. That's why it looks as if we've wasted a lot of utterance that comes our way. When God speaks, he expects you to follow it up. Yes. That's what God expects. Mm-hmm. Now, God spoke to Abraham. Then in verse 18, look at what he did. Chapter 13, verse 18. Did you see what he did? Mm-hmm. Then Abraham moved his tent. He went and dwelt by the terebin trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And what did he do there? And he built an altar there to the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. You need to build altar where God spoke to you. If we come for a meeting, like a church service, 
and the word of God came. And in the middle of the message, you sense that God hooked your heart on a particular Bible passage. I don't know whether it happens to you. That Charles may be preaching, he's speaking so many things. But in the middle of what he's saying, he just referred casually to a Bible verse. And the Spirit of God compelled you to look at it. And once you got there, you were hooked. Mm. That was your own message for the day. Mm. You may not even hear the rest of the mm. things that Charles is saying again. God has spoken to you. Mm. You could even close your Bible and go away. <laughs> Why? <laughs> what Charles was still speaking? Because you already caught your own, isn't it? Now, what do you do? That's where to build your heart. <laughs> you don't allow that to go. If you were the only person in the meeting, Charles should have stopped. Because God has spoken. But because there are yet others that are waiting for their own word, he must keep speaking. Yeah. <laughs> and you see, you are not, it's not compulsory that you must follow him to the end. You've caught your own and you are hooked there. That's how to. But many times, you know what we do? When God had dropped your own word for you, you don't act on it. You are struggling to follow around. Yeah. And at the end of the message, everything is lost. Mm -hmm. So you went home as if God had not spoken. Mm -hmm. It's because you didn't know how to anchor what God is saying to you mm -hmm. on your own altar. Mm -hmm. This man built an altar there to the Lord. And I noticed that several times where they built altars, they even named their altar. Mm. So most of the names of God we have today, mm -hmm. do you know that they are the names that individuals that met God decided to call him? Do you know that? Do you know that there was nothing like Jehovah Jireh before? It was because when Abraham was to offer his son Isaac and he had built that altar and God immediately showed him the, 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 the lamb that was caught by his ticket. Do you remember the, 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 the lamb that was caught by the horn in the ticket? Yes. And he said he went and took it. And the Bible said he called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. That at the month of the Lord it shall be seen. So today we all call God Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh. Now I love that. But you see, how dare me call him Jehovah Jireh when I didn't see him? Abraham was calling him that name because that's how God appeared to him Jehovah the Provider. Now it has become God's name today. Do you know that? That's become God's name today. Because somebody encountered God as the God of provision. It has become our own God too. Excuse me. And I didn't see God restricting them and say, who are you to name me like that? They had the liberty of calling him the way he has appeared to them. Oh, I found that our generation He's very, very deficient. And it's all because we have raised a generation of believers who do not press in to make the most of the access we have in Christ Jesus. When I saw that the books that have affected the whole world were written by human beings like ourselves, can you imagine? People that wrote and he shaped the theology of the whole world. And they got it not because they went to the moon. They got it on their knees. Why not I? That's the question. Why not you? Let's summarize the building of others. How do we do it? Let's go back to that exodus. There are a few little, little things that I think 
we can tie together there. Exodus 20, then 24. Exodus 20. You will see few words, but I want to just itemize them so we can pray. Number one, he said, an altar of earth you shall make for me. <clears throat> an altar of what? Of earth. Ordinary clay. Excuse me, brothers and sisters. God is not asking you to build an altar that is different from who you are. God knows that we are clay. And it is his glory that the treasure will be in an earthen vessel. Let's not pretend about who we are. We are still human. The grace of God comes into our ordinariness to bring out the glory of God. We are not angels. We are human. And because we are human, God is saying, build an altar of earth to me. Don't build a relationship with God on what you are not. Do you know that God is not saying, until you become like this, I cannot relate with you. That's not what God is saying. God wants to relate with you from where you are. He is an author of us. And if we are just clay in the hand of the potter, what a beautiful thing. Because God can always start from anything to make something out of nothing. Huh? So look, when you want to begin your relationship with him, don't wait until you become supernatural. Build an altar of earth. I wish you can do that. I wish you will be as natural in relating with God. While you are desiring to grow, build on what you are. Let's come into his presence just as we are. Make an altar of earth unto me. God is willing to accept you where you are. Because if you are available in his hand, he can make something out of you. And to me, that is the glory of the, of the Christian life. The Christian life is not a perfect man that has just started on a perfect note and is always doing perfect things. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life is a weakling that is surrendered into the hand of the mighty God. And God, in his infinite graciousness, is making something great out of nothing. And people say, ah, ah can something good come out of this Nazareth? Say, well, it is marvelous in our eyes. This is what the Lord God has done. That's the miracle. The miracle is that God starts from the ordinary earth and is producing a, a choice vessel. Let's begin where we are. Make an altar of earth unto me. Don't make it of anything else. Then, on your altar, look at it. You shall sacrifice on it. What? I want you to note the personal pronoun there. What did he say? Your bond offerings. And your peace offerings. Your sheep. Your oxen. In every place where I record my name. I will come to you and I will bless you. Look at this. What makes an altar? Effective is your offering on it. Your burnt offering, your peace offering. Now, the old King James used the word peace offering, but the NIV, I hope NIV, will use something like your fellowship offering. Fellowship offering. Fellowship offering. Hallelujah. You see, the altar will become obsolete if you are not having burnt offerings. If you are not having fellowship offerings. 
The only thing that makes your altar active, effective, and relevant is that every time you have something to do on it. Do you understand? Now, when you have started a relationship, look, Charles, you had some friends years ago. Can you tell us what killed your friendship with some of such men? Lack of contact. Lack of contact. You've got it, sir. There is no friendship where there is no communication. A great friendship will die when no contact is maintained. And yet there is somebody that you are not so much friendly with, but you meet with him every day, and you have something to say. What happens to that friendship? It becomes great. It grows. What makes our altar effective is that you have something doing on it every time. Your bond offering. Your bond offering, your consecration. The promises you are making to God and say, Lord, I want to serve you. Even if that's all you want to tell him every time you come to the altar, you are doing something to keep your altar alive. But then, secondly, it says your fellowship offering. Fellowship. Fellowship. I want to say, sir, that prayer is not because you have a problem. For a servant of God, it's not because we have a problem. That's why we pray. Prayer for us is fellowship with God. Actually, you can go to God and just meet with Him and say, Sir, I just come to visit you. I have no problem, sir. I know you have been helping me, but I just want to be with you. And just enjoy Him. And just thank Him and say, Sir, I just have been wanting to come and say thank you for who you have been to me. Oh, Lord, thank you for who you have been. I thank you. I don't have any particular problem today. I just wanted to greet you. Or oh, did you think God is not interested in that? He is. Just to come and fellowship with Him. Just to come and kneel down and say, Oh, Father is good. And don't worry that you sleep off. Are you hearing me? Don't let the devil come and hit your head and say, You were praying the other time and you slept. What is his business? <laughs> what is his business? When you when 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 uh, when uh, uh, Alice or Ella, when they are talking with you, do you know that in the middle of the talk, what happened to to them? Sometimes they sleep on your lap. Mm -hmm. Then you beat them. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you do? Is that what you do? Is that what you do? No. No. And you know, our Father in heaven is a better Father than any of us. He said, if you that are evil knows how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your Father, your Heavenly Father. That's to show you that the Heavenly Father understands our frame much more than anything else. Praise the Lord. No. Oh, as I was talking, I doze up. That's not the issue. Talk with him. <laughs> if it's possible for you to sleep on your knees, you know, at the feet of the Lord, and when you wake again, I say, Oh, Father, I didn't know where I stopped, but I slept, so let's continue. There's no problem. <laughs> a stage will come. You see, a stage will come when in your communion with him, you will be too fascinated to sleep. It's a matter of growth. I want you to know that God is asking you to come and build an altar very simply. Rather than wait until you can have a one-month fasting and prayer, God appreciates a 15-minute regular discussion with him. Yes. What killed some of our altar? And I said, I don't have enough time. When I have time, when I can really settle down, then I will talk to God. No. God wants you to take that five minutes yeah. and talk with Him. Yeah. As you talk with Him in five minutes, you discover that you thought it was five minutes. It may be one hour. Yeah. Yeah. You see, when you enter into this art of communion, it becomes a joy. It's not all the, you know, oh God. No. 
very simple. You won't know when you have spent two hours mm. talking with him. May God grant us that experience. He says, if you make an altar of stone, which God doesn't want, God doesn't want you to make an altar of stone, rigid, strong. Mm -mm. But if you do, you shall not build it of hewn stone. Because if you use your tool on it, you are profaned it. In case you find your heart so hard, even in your hardness, if you can make an altar, God knows how to handle it. Are you hearing me? Look, if you see any man who can go to God, that's the man that God can use. I don't care, sir, about how rough a man is, if he can go to God. If you see a man whose life is not regular, but he can go to God, and he knows how to kneel down, yeah. don't worry about that man, because God will make him. Yes, yeah. amen. Mm -hmm. The big place where God makes men is the altar. Yes. I wish you get there regularly. Yeah. It is at the altar, those areas of your life that doesn't fit God's plan, he will chisel it out. We say, look, my daughter, I want to use you, but you are, you are talkative. I don't like this. You say, Lord, you talk too much. I don't know. You say, yes, I know. That's the hindrance. I will cut it. Had the altar God, he changes us. He corrects us until we fit into what he wants us to be. Please, come to that place. Finally. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. That's the final thing. You know, when you need a step eh, to climb up, it means the altar is higher than your level. Eh? Don't build an altar that is too high for where you are. Don't build an altar that you are struggling to do like this. Do like this. Do like this. No. God is not the one that is setting that unreachable standard for you. The way God deals with us is that he takes us one step at a time. I read a book some years ago. I want to conclude with that. I think it was E.M. Barnes. How many of you have come across some of the books by E.M. Barnes? Thank you. He wrote a book Power through prayer. Now, if you have read that book, there is always a postscript before every chapter. And one of it, he was talking about one man, I don't know whether it's Richard Baxter or somebody, who said he would never have breakfast unless he had prayed eight hours. <laughs> eight hours. So when I calculated how many hours will eight hours be before breakfast, I saw that that man may have woken up somewhere around 1 a.m. And he must be praying till 9 before he could have eight hours. And I wanted to, 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 to do that. And I tried. I couldn't make it. <laughs> Until one day the Lord said to me, Don't make an altar that you have to climb to with steps. It's higher than you. Say, so, Pastor didn't tell you where he started. Those who prayed eight hours a day before breakfast, they didn't start with eight hours. Why don't you start where you are? <laughs> Oh, how I was delivered that day. <laughs> because you know, I was training myself. I was training myself. I wanted to be eight hours before breakfast. I set an arbitrary standard. The Lord said, no. If it is 30 minutes, I have accepted it. So then I learned to enjoy 30 minutes. Yeah. 
Then I learned to enjoy one hour. Then it grew onto two hours. And I said, Lord, thank you. And if I couldn't make two hours today, and I made 30 minutes, what matters is that God is happy with me. Amen. Amen. Will you please build an altar? Not by steps. Don't be struggling to do like this. Don't like this. No. Please cherish men that have gone ahead of us. Thank God for them. Is that all right? When they have challenged you that you can come to this level, when you get back, please realize where you are. There is where God will come to you. God is not going to look for you where you are not. And I wish we can relate with him from there. Let's climb from where we are. Yeah. Let's build. And I'm sure that uh, from your personal intimacy with God, this church will be blessed. This church will be blessed. This community will be blessed. And men and women in our generation will come to benefit from what is appearing to be your private relationship with God now. It will be a blessing. Let's pray together as we close here. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you. Oh, Lord, we give you praise. Oh, Lord, we ask you this, this afternoon that you will have Oh God, to know that you really want to relate with us, to know that a new and living way had been consecrated for us through your flesh, that the veil had been broken, and that we can come fearlessly, just as we are, by the blood of Jesus. Oh, just to know, just to know that you are not against us just to know that what you see is the blood you are not saying our faults you are not witch hunting us you are not saying you have done this don't come here oh you are saying come 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 let us reason together thank you holy spirit i just pray that your children we will respond to you. We will come to that level where it is you walking in us, talking in us, moving in us, your wonderful things to perform among men. Lord, I ask that this brief quiet that you have allowed us to look into today, it looked ordinary. But we sense that this is what your heart is yearning for. Yes. It didn't look high sounding. Mm. But we know that you are showing us the secret of greatness. Yes. What made others great? Mm. You want to show us. Mm. They were not copycats. They were men that were real. Mm. They came as they were. They were ready to be honest. They owned up their shortcomings. They were clay in your hand. Their altars were of earth. So you can remold them. You can reshape them. You can do with them what you wish to do. Lord, I ask that even we also may come into this living, progressive experience with you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I commend your people to you. Please go with us. And let this day that we have taken apart, yes. let it add to our story. Yes. Let it be a reference point yes. to our walk with you. Yes. Where there is barrier of blackmail. Yes. Where the devil, the accuser of the brethren, has said, you are, you are finished, you can't make it. We know it's a lie. Mm. We know he who loves us, yes. who gave himself for us, will not abandon us. We know. We know that you are still waiting. Say, come to me. Let us talk it over. Oh, Lord, please help us to come. Help us. We will arise and we will come. Thank you. Lord, I pray for the various ministries, departments in the church that we represent, that the men we lead, they will touch a freshness in our lives. They will touch a freshness 
a freshness of your grace, a freshness of your power, and that, Lord, the intimacy you've been asking us to step into, say, come up here. I'll show you what is about to be. Please bring us to that place. Bring us that access to your presence that we might maximize it. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen.